I'd like to see if I can actually bring neuroscience into focus for you. And as you can see, the idea here is what do we do with our neuroscience? That is to say, how do we develop a sense of reverence? How do we develop that moral sense? And can neuroscience indeed do such a thing? I offer a single premise, that the neuroscience that I practice and the neuroscience that many of my colleagues practices that we adhere to is not necessarily a science of reduction. It may allow some construct of inter-theoretical reductionism such that, as you saw earlier, perhaps we may be able to take our psychology and explain it at least in part through the notion of a biological interface, which then must engage sociology. And we can explain particular sociological terms in terms of an atomistic physics, perhaps, within the larger goal of a systems theory. But then we have to recontextualize that in such a way, and we can never disembed the elements of the whole in such a way to allow us to really explore what the parts are all about. That is to say, we need both. Neuroscience, if it has given us nothing else in the past 5, 10, 15, 25 years, has been, I think, a florid illustration that any attempt at frank reductionism leaves us wanting at a cognitive crest, what the philosopher Colin McGinn used to call cognitive closure. Uh, he's softened somewhat, and he begins to think now that perhaps we might be on a crest, but it's an evolving crest with a very distant shoreline that, in fact, seems to become ever more elusive on the horizon of possibility and understanding as we're propelled forward by both technology and our need to know. So one of the things that neuroscience does, one of the things that neuroscience strives to do, one of the things that neuroscience should strive to do is to understand relationships, and I think it does that quite well. I think that's a more optimistic view of what neuroscience has achieved. It understands, for example, as we saw here, the relationships of the internal dynamic to its internal environment. Cells working within systems, working within an organism, working within groups of organisms that are then nested in an environment both across time and then nested within time. We understand that. What it does is it, it attempts to explain the role of neural systems qua systems, not necessarily as units working in isolation, but what nervous systems do is communicate. They relate. They do so by virtue of neuronal cells, they do so by virtue of glial cells, and they do not do so in isolation. And we know that they function as bidirectional hierarchical networks that have many of the properties of a network, including the inextricability of many of those parts from its whole. As such, we know that what we see is that indeed Neural systems work as complex dynamical systems in a complex dynamical system, which is an organism that is embedded within a complex dynamical system, which are environments over time. Can I extricate one from the other and get a full and authentic explanation of how they interact? Certainly not. Would I dare to try? Not unless I was being a frank anachronist. And these days, I think there's something almost sinful about being an anachronist, in that to say, if we take the knowledge that we have, aren't we compelled to use it in ways that don't necessarily retain older views and fault concepts in a way that is destructive, but rather looks forward in a way that is creative? What then do neural systems do? As you heard this morning, and I hope as you've gotten out of this afternoon, they really do three things. They function in reception what's going on interoceptively. How does the internal environment in some way interact with its external environment? It recognizes particular dynamics that we tend to sort of parse into binaries, but indeed they're not binaries. What we recognize is these are degrees of distinctions that may be very, very small, and we create sometimes these artificial, if not practical, kinds of distinctions because it helps us navigate the very, very torturous world of our environment. And it helps us relate to that environment. We function by degree, and some of those degrees I have illustrated for you here, the idea of on-off. Is the neural cell firing or is it not? Well, it's always sort of chugging along, so it's not necessarily that it's off. It's how off is it or how on is it at any particular time, not in frank binaries of black and white, but in degrees, separations, if you will, that allow particular levels of activity not solipsistically as a single unit, but existing within other units of neural cells, glial cells, within part of the organ system that is the peripheral and central nervous system that in no way is different than the body in which it innervates. Part of that is to determine what's inside and what's outside, because that's important. Things that might need to stay outside might have to stay outside. And there's a 
particular sense of possession. There's a particular specialness about what exists inside, inside the cell, inside the organ, inside the person. And in fact, we function on those distinctions. Me, you, self, non-self. The neural system is certainly not the only one to make that distinction. Our immunological systems do that quite well. It is a survival mechanism that not only we as humans incur and entail, but many organisms, if not all, need to do so that they can indeed function within a variety of our environments, some positive and some negative. And the idea of the distinction between positivity and negativity is something that neural systems help us to intuit on a variety of scales from the very, very small to the very, very large. And each one of these relationalities is indeed translatable from the level of the synaptic, as you heard this morning, to the social group. And that becomes important. Because what we see is that neural systems are indeed embodied. Neural systems do not simply arise and then drop out of the sky into some body. They arise from the stuff of the body itself without boring you with a bunch of neuroembryology, which is in fact a perfectly valid way to attach a prefix neuro to something. How do nerve cells and glial cells arise from the embryological matrix during development? Body and the stuff of psyche, body and the stuff that might in fact instantiate the emergent processes that we struggle with to call mind, arise from common substrates. Indeed they do. This is not a sense of Cartesian dualism where we say, well, this is mind and this is body, this is mind and this is brain, but rather that brain mind arises to deal with the body that it arose in, it arose from. It is a functional networked hierarchy. Indeed, what we know is that both psyche then, the process, the emergent processes that we're trying to get our head around, if you will, big pun intended, that in fact dictate how our bodies navigate through the environment and through time, interact with each other, how we feel from inside, how we relate those feelings to those outside, our conduct, the basis of our behaviors, our intentionality. What does that mean to be then nested within our environment? And what is the substrate of that environment? Is it culture? Culture is what? Culture as perhaps medium. Much as I would say culture like a petri dish of culture, that which gives rise. My colleague Kevin Fitzgerald spoke to you this morning about the nature of genetics and one of the things we know that both genetics do nicely as do neural systems is provide predispositions. Combinations, if you will, that in indeed establish preconditions that arose out of necessity from given environments internally and externally. I look around the room and I see that each one of you, I am sure, had both a mother and a father. It didn't happen spontaneously, they got there for a reason. That reason may have been geographic, it may have been demographic, it may have been intentional, it may have been accidental, who knows. But that was an environment that brought those two gene pools momentarily together to make the unis that is you, the toi et of you. That established a precondition. You are then part of an environment that was in utero. You have an environment postnatally. See one brain, see one brain. It develops in response to those environments based upon those predispositions. And that then gives you the embodied brain mind that the phenomenological philosophers and psychiatrists referred to as the lived body. You know the unis of you because it arose from the stuff that you are. Yet that stuff that you are exists not distinct from a series of environments and interactions, but within them and perhaps because of them. And as a result, it needs to both recognize and relate to different hierarchies in those environments. If nothing else, it compels us to strive to understand the basis of our moral interaction because we are so embedded, and that is an inextricability. It senses, it feels the existential event of being alive. And if, in fact, an organism of any neural system had but one capacity, it would sense its lived self on some level or another, those of us who are working in cognitive and physiological psychology and neuroscience, try to reduce in an intertheoretical way what might be necessary for neural systems to be able to give rise to this entity called consciousness. It's a sense of the lived self. How many neurons are necessary for that? How many connectivities? What is the density of a neural pile that might be sufficient to obtain that dimension? And the number might be incredibly small. What that really allows is at least some apprehension of what neural systems are trying to do. And I'm using a term very, very anthropomorphically here. What neural systems do quite well, 
is they linked the moment of the experience of the lived body right now to its past, its present, and make some predictions about its future. What decisions should I make about what's in, what's out? To go left, to go right. Degrees of distinction that are going to allow me to advance this self, this lived body, this life world, however simple or complex, into the next moment. There's a subjectivity that goes along with that, for sure. Indeed, that subjectivity is the subjectivity of containment. What you've heard from all of our speakers this morning is that neural systems exist within an embodied self. Neuroscientists, philosophers struggle with what the nature of that self is, but at very, very least, it's the neural system functioning with a set of bodily structures that it grew up with, that it was embedded within an environment, and that it's nested with. This is what the phenomenologists refer to as the life world as it is experienced. And I'll give you the 800-pound gorilla in the room. I want you all to think back to your 10th birthday. Look around the room. Just as our faces are different, our phenotypes are different, our physiognomies and habitus are different, realistically, the brain that was organized to deal with your particular physiology in your environment experienced that day very differently, just as we all, eight years ago, have very different, albeit profound, memories of what 9-11 means to you. And what it does is it senses the subjectivity of life events. On the most rudimentary level, what Damasio calls the feeling of what happens. Is it biological? Indeed. Do I dare deny the biological identification of the self? Certainly not. Is it psychological? Of course it is. Because the manifestations of brain as mind, irrespective of what we may call it, as my colleague Gil Pachik and I struggle with a new lexicon, what do we call this thing, mind, consciousness, self? Do we refer back to the German term Geist because it has deep meaning? But what does that do for an English speaker? We posit it perhaps we should call it Ramona. It means nothing, however we can give it some life. We can give it a folk term. But then, what if we do? What if this thing, brain, mind, Geist, Selbst, the moi et of me, what is that? What does that mean? Certainly, it is subjective. It is subjective to both my life events and given the fact that I exist in an environment that is not an environment that is alone because we are dependent, rational animals. It is a life world and a life event and experience that allows me to interface with others. In some ways, it necessitates my living with others because if my nervous system is to thrive, if my nervous system is to guide my biology in a way that dictates how my psychology interacts with the social sphere of even my physical social environment, it must learn. From what? From things outside. From other nervous systems that are like. From other nervous systems that are dislike. It must make those discriminations. In other words, it senses others in relation to itself. And this, ladies and gentlemen, provides for us what I call the neural paradox. Indeed, neural systems, by their very nature, by their function, allows any organism to function independently, to grow, thrive, flourish. I don't think any one of our speakers this morning would deny that the beauty of having a neural system as a simple evolutionary and developmental tool, as an asset, allows that organism to function independently to seek particular stuffs for nourishment, to avoid particular harms. Yet, the paradox is that to be independent, we must be dependent. We must, in fact, come from a body that is dependent upon external resources for its substrates. We must be dependent upon an environment. And we as humans, as I said, don't climb trees real good, run real fast, suck oxygen out of the water or fly. We are dependent upon others. And as such, we may have developed those skills. We may have developed those predispositions and substrates in such a way as Dr. Casebeer has indicated. In fact, it may very well be that the artifacts of our biology expressed psychologically through our society provides the systems for common morality that Dr. Gert has posited. It may very well be that our genetics, as posited by Dr. Fitzgerald earlier this morning, are indeed a predispositional substrate that allow particular phenotypes to be expressed that give us strengths weaknesses and allow us to maximize those strengths as to try to delimit our own survival because what we experience is trying to advance ourselves into tomorrow. Indeed, we become reliant upon others to do that. Our biology, our weaknesses and our strengths,
compel something of our social dynamics for our survivability. Here I attach the prefix neural to the word anthropology in the most literal sense. How is it that an understanding of our neural systems might be in some way helpful to explain the anthropological and social dynamic of both humans as individuals and as a species? Not alone, but existing with other species, competitively, in series of environments that we then change. We're adapting rational species. Is our morality, in fact, in some way, quote, hardwired into the substrates of our brain? Well, our brain is certainly hardwired into the substrates of our body, and survivability and the feeling of what happens is definitely a driving force to advance us into our tomorrow so that we can then ground our present and our previous experiences. Is that the golden rule? Is it perhaps, as Dr. Faf had mentioned this morning, that indeed we look at what we could do to others, we look at the damage that can be done, and we make particular predictions about the embodied selves in our experience of life about what we should do. And what that does is that gives us particular social structures, changes our capabilities. In that way, we may be able to point to what might be common substrates of morality. Is it neurological? Oh, yes, because we're neurological. Are we just? Absolutely not. On one level, perhaps if I were going to be a physicalist, I could reduce the human to its physical interactions, but that would not capture the essence of what it means to express those physiological effects dynamically with others. And as Professor Scruton noted, it's erroneous, if not fallacious, if not ethically wrong to do so based upon only partial information because you fall into that fallacy far too quickly, and as a consequence, we then may be doomed to use partial information in ways that may be wholly destructive. So if then we're going to posit what the goods are that we've heard this morning, what are those goods? What are those wrongs? How can we, in fact, guide our research so as to maximize our search towards the good when, in fact, these days, the technological imperative lends our development our progress to be very, very rapid and very, very profound. How can we exercise some level of caution knowing that the status quo is progress and be able to be self-reflective to do it? Will neuroscience give us that? Well, those things that we consider to be goods, by definition, provided for you here. Goods are those things that have intrinsic value, that are strive to be preserved. It reflects in a non-circular way our definition of morality, I think, as Professor Gert provided for us, that is sense and actions that strive to preserve the good. What goods? What are those intrinsic goods that span the biopsychosocial that perhaps we can look for both common underlying physiological substrates and recognize the importance of their psychosocial expression? Certainly, the live body and the life world. Life, mitigation of pain, as Albert Schweitzer had claimed, life striving to maintain life amongst other lives. And here, whoops. Oh, no, no, let's go back. And here we see the brain mind, and I use that term very, very loosely. I use that term to allow some folk recognition of the thing that I'm talking about. Neural systems as a bi-directional networked hierarchy, as a system nested within other systems, embedded and functioning within others, I leave you with this, that an organism has a brain, but is a mind. And the combination of having a brain that is inextricably nested within an environmental system that is the body that functions within an external environment dictates sensitivity to self, first and foremost, because it's the point of orientation. It is the feeling of what happens, but it has to relate to self with regard to others. Others as being alive, others as perhaps having feeling, emotionality. And we as humans have developed particular sensitivities to that, but we're not alone in that either. Before we get too anthropocentric and feel ourselves to be self-inflated in some regard, there are plenty of other species that are very, very sensitive to the moods, emotionality, and perhaps cognitions of others on a variety of cues, as Dr. Faf will tell you. Some very, very cognitive, and others a direct link between their hormonal systems based upon a variety of pheromonal cues. Some of those, incidentally, we had and no longer possess. Perhaps a bit of regression, a little bit of our own biopsychosocial anachronism might be to our own benefit. How then do we compensate for not only the things that we have, but the things that we have not? In many ways, then, what we can see is that this brain-mind is not only generator, hasn't only given us the artifacts of our social groups in working together, its tools 
such as our machines and our technology and perhaps our understanding, but it's also needing to be a receiver. On the most fundamental level, that reception is biological. We spoke to this earlier. Some of the appear, appear to be binaries of on, off, inside, outside, self, non-self, reception of what those relationships mean, but certainly those receptions go more than that. Those receptions also mean how do we intuit our relationships with those factors in our environment that are beneficial to us, that might be harmful to us, and in many ways how do we maximize our own behavior so as to be able to sustain those relationships. The complexification of our brain-mind allows us to make particular abstractions. Rules, mores, codifications. Do they change over time? Yes. Are they built upon some underlying biology? Yes. In many ways, this then points us to what might be a circle of science. With a very, very big nod to Piaget, who looked at the circle of science as relates to physics and mathematics, we here pose one that's related to neuroscience and morality. Very simply, this is the $25 definition of what neuroethics strives to be. Basically, what we see is that neural systems enable the development of our use of a variety of skills, abilities, etc. And this then gives us the capacity to work what we call negentropically, that is to take raw information and create raw, raw stimulation and energy and create information out of that that's meaningful to us in some ways that allow us to intuit those things in our environment that necessitate us being able to link our past present into a lived body in the future. And in fact, that very same set of neural systems allows us the capacity to study those neural systems. And if we learn nothing else from neuroscience, we should look to the strengths and limitations of how our brain, mind, and works and recognize that this gives us tremendous leverage, purchase, but also limitation to consider how we use the information, capability, and tools that we have. So what is neuroscience as a tool? You spent the better part of the last six hours listening to a variety of neuroscientists, philosophers, talking to you about what neuroscience can and cannot do. Let me see if I can put a bow on it for you. Neuroscience, both as a brain function and as a scientific pursuit, allows insight to the capacity of brains and minds. On the most fundamentally biopsychosocial level, it allows us to relate to each other. On the most abstract and complex, it allows us to look deeply into ourselves and try to peer at the mystery that is the brain-mind so we can unpack that so as to be able to get better leverage as to what it means for us to be and to relate to each other. Certainly, we look for those relationships in both ourselves and in others. I spent the past 30 years as a pain researcher. Some of those fundamental goods and fundamental harms that Dr. Gert has spoken about realistically do ring true. We look to others and we look to our relationship with them and we ask questions, do they suffer? Are they aware? Are they sentient? Do they have consciousness? Do they have a mind? What then does it mean to be a brain and have a mind? And to do so with regard to the human condition also points to the fact that the human condition has created and arises from culture as a medium and as a forum. And it's become rich. Trying to reduce that culture down to something that is no longer is erroneous. Indeed, as Dr. Kay's beer pointed out, it's important for us to contextualize to the here and now. It may be wonderful for us to use our neurobiological skills to do what we do wonderfully, which is match to a past sample. But if we're going to survive, let's use that neuroscience to do what we do best, match it to the present so as to navigate the future. Indeed, what we recognize is that we are no longer organisms of small communities of nomads wandering around with discrete values that are based upon very individual groups of our physiology. Those gene pools are long gone. As Dr. Fitzgerald said, yes, we may retain some of those characteristics, but we've become a blended species in many, many ways, biologically, physiologically, culturally, socially, and perhaps morally. How then do we take this information and rely upon our social structures for our continued interaction existence? What I urge is simply this. Progress because it will occur, prudence because it needs to. What you've heard today may provide some insight. You may walk out of the room and you say, well, I didn't know that. Or you may be scratching your head and go, well, they didn't know that either. But understand that insight does not give forth judgment. 
judgment is one of those things that, in fact, certainly relies on our biopsychosocial selves. We need to have judgment about the knowledge we have and the knowledge we don't, and how we use the knowledge and the gaps in between. Might we be striving for a common good? Perhaps. But defining those common goods is certainly going to take at least some level of stakeholder perception, consensus, discourse, if not dialectic. But I think what we're really striving for scientifically, sociologically, and perhaps on a larger ontological sense is recognizing our dependence upon each other as this world that we live in and its environment shrinks to such a way that our dependencies become apparent. And what we're probably moving towards is an increasing recognition of the importance of our moral capacity. In many ways, this speaks back to the Aristotelian notion of practical wisdom, phronesis. Perhaps it's a neo-Aristotelian concept of what phronesis, practical wisdom, prudence really means. Well, indeed, neuroscience is able to articulate particular descriptions of the substrates of brain and mind, but we must be prudent, as Professor Scruton urged, and not fall to the default position of neuro-ubiquity and neuro-nonsense. Understanding that when we use the neuro-prefix, what we really mean is a continued debate about what we know, what we don't, and what we remain unknowable, and how we use the information that we possess. Moreover, the fact that we have a self, we are a mind, gives us vivid awareness of the richness of the experience of having a brain and mind. So if we're going to move then towards a practical wisdom, I give you the, uh, the Thomistic quote, which sounds wonderful in Latin, recta ratio speculabilium, recta ratio agibilium. The right measure of knowledge to compel the right measure of actions. We need not ignore our neuroscience, but we need not take it as wholly sacrosanct. We need to turn the mirror of introspection not only to our neurons, but also to our neuroscience and how we use these techniques. We need to recognize that by essence, our actions are an extension of our thought. This is in fact fueled by knowledge, and in this way, knowledge is important. But our legacy doesn't necessarily lie in the knowledge, but rather, what we do with what we know. And so in this regard, I think one of the things that becomes important for us to learn about neuroscience, for us to learn about our biological substrates, is that in fact we are living organisms. And that we experience that life as a fundamental good. And that there are mysteries to that life that we seek to explore and explain, but that may remain elusive to us. But what that should teach us is not that that is something that needs to be simplified or minimized, but rather that is the source of reverence. Realistically, it's reverence because we recognize that the most fundamental good that any neural system strives for, irrespective of its complexification, is it struggles to live among other lives that are living. What my colleague Roly Benedictor and I referred to in translation, we refer to it in German as the enabled psyche or the engaged soul irrespective of how complex that psyche or soul may be and the nervous system that it arises from. Realistically, what this then compels us to do is two things. It compels us towards some level of mutual respect. That is to say, we are all biopsychosocial creatures. Our biologies are unique, yet we share certain things in common. Our psychologies that arise from those biologies and interact with them are equally unique, yet we share certain things in common. And certainly, our social dynamics are unique but we're in the social boat together. And as such, as we move towards a more unified, pluralized world that is ever shrinking because of the artifacts of what our brain minds can do, it necessitates such unity among plurality. It necessitates shedding light in the sense of nur onto what we are and what we don't know. And what it necessitates and mandates is a sense of responsibility to use knowledge in ways that is not just technically correct, but that strives towards moral goodness. This work was supported by a number of different people, not the least of which is the Noor Foundation. And one of the things that I would like to impress upon each and all of you is that science as we see it cannot exist in vacuo. Neuroscience doesn't come up with all the answers. In fact, if you got 10 neuroscientists in the room and you said, explain mind to me, you might get 12 answers. I was a pain researcher, as I said, for 30 years. It's the focus of much of my work, the neuroethics of pain. We still pose the TSD question. What is pain? How can we explain pain? How can we explain, as Professor Scruton said, beauty 
How can we explain Olympia, Venus, music? How can we explain the human condition and the human predicament? And perhaps we cannot do that scientifically. Oh yes, we can talk about the physics of color, we can talk about the physics of musicality and tone, but does that indeed bridge the ineffability of that which we experience, a feeling of what happens not only for ourselves, but a way of communicating those more abstract components of the brain mind that exists embodied as an expression of what we are and what we feel? I believe the answer to the question is no. Neuroscience can do wonderful things, but it will dare not do so in a vacuum that is devoid of the humanities. And as such, I think one of the things that is happening is not this neurobiquity that Professor Scruton referred to earlier of neuroaesthetics or neuroart history, but rather an understanding that there are particular limitations that neuroscience provides, yet we understand that neural systems are well-tuned and very responsive to those things that are far more abstract than we can just allow by virtue of an interdigitized analysis of how neurons work. This is the stuff of art. And we may, in fact, turn the skill of science to understanding how brains and minds may work, but it in no way dispels the power and necessity of art for what we do as a species.